Um, so thank you very much for joining us at this lunchtime as part of our live project lunchtime webinar series. Um, we'll put links to the website and all of that and places you can find more resources in the chat as well for people who'd like to follow the project a little bit more, or if anyone would like to visit us here in Ivoran, South Kerry, or across in Clin on the, the Welsh Peninsula. I definitely see one person who's joining us from, from Clin. Um, and the meeting is being recorded. You will have got the, the notification when you came in, um, but we can, we do edit them before we share them and put them online. So if there's anything that you'd like to have edited out, you can let us know. Um, and it's just gonna be recording the, the people speaking. Um, and I think that's all of the housekeeping. Um, so I'll hand you over to Evan Lam, who is chair of Heritage Ivora, and she works with us on the live project looking at archaeology and cultural heritage of the Ivra Peninsula in South Kerry. And copper mining is her favourite thing, as well as mushrooms. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, So if you'd like to, to kick us off there, even I'll stay for it. Uh, hi, delighted that you're here and delighted to be able to um, yeah, share what um, we've been doing with you. Um, so Lucy's introduced live project. Um, <clears throat> Yes, so like one of the things is that our, our, our Bronze Age, um, we're really, we're talking about copper mines here now, but our Bronze Age is also our, our Gold Age. So um, we, we, we seem to have, we have no evidence for gold mining in Ireland. So it seems to have either come from England, or, um, lead isotope analysis suggests that it either came from the southwest of Ireland or from, from Britain, but um, our copper, definitely came from here. So in the early stages of the Bronze Age, um, there was a Copper Age, so it's called the Chalcolithic, which is a nice term because it reflects the lithic in, in the word, um, reflects the, the, the transition from the Stone Age to the Metal Age. And, uh, and we'll see that when the copper has been harvested, it was actually um, like Stone Age technology that was being used. So it's just really totally at that cost and um, and so we have really good dating, and I'll talk about that in a bit. But um, our our earliest copper mines date from two thousand four hundred BC, and these are mines that we can we can visit. Like it, it's um, it's one of the fantastic um, resources we have on Ivra. Um, so this map of copper mines um, that's on the archaeological survey. So. Um, they not every copper mine or copper working is on the archaeological survey, only workings that are dated to pre 1700 and then some exceptions. So the, um, the ones in Galway, um, according to the National Monuments Service archive, they're actually more recent. And uh, now we've learned that there's, a, there's one in Meath as well, so you need to look that up. But the Bronze Age mines that we know a date from the Bronze Age are in Southwest Ireland. And, um, and I've indicated for the Black Arrow, the ones that are near Killarney. So they're, they, they're the largest, huge um, load of copper has been extracted from those mines at Ross Island and Mockross since the um, beginnings of the Bronze Age and the Chalcolithic. And then we have smaller mines um, spread along the peninsula. So Anivara, um, Bera, and Mizen. Um, for a lot of the information that we have on um, the early copper mining in Ireland is um, due to research by um, Professor William O'Brien. He's the head of archaeology at GCC. And his book, um, I just show an image there, that's a multidisciplinary study. And it's um, Magnus Opus, like, uh, you won't really see me holding it up, but. Um, anyway, it, it's it's actually um, only forty euro nowadays from the student bookshop in UCC. So I'd really recommend buying it if you're interested. And um, and I'm giving some um, links at the end to um, maybe more recent material and other material that will sub supplement um, and also give um, you know our sources for some of the uh, material that I'm giving in the talk today. So, um, so when, like normally when people talk about copper mining, it's from the miner's perspective. So like if you're a miner, you know, 
what are, are the kind of what process are you going to go through? So like um, begins with looking for the copper and then mining, sorting, smelting, casting it. And what I've shown in the image is um, what's called native copper. So that's copper in its natural state. And like we have very little of that in Ireland. Like I've read a paper where there's some supposedly um, in the north of Ireland, but like it's not thought that was ever discovered, say, in the early Bronze Age. So the kind of the alchemy of copper mining is that you get the ore and the ore has been smelted to make the copper. So that's the, the kind of the amazingness. And like this is what with metallurgy, this that discovery was the really thing that changed everything. Um, so native copper is found in some parts of the world. So like in places like Syria, they had their Bronze Age, like um, 8,000 or more years before we did. So they were like, if you like, extremely advanced with regards to metallurgy. <clears throat> but what we're talking today is <clears throat> us. So we're the people now walking through a landscape where we're hiking. And it's like how we can see like traces of um, copper, how we can identify it and <clears throat> how we can understand like what we're seeing so um like there are various you know lots of clues and uh, and these clues have led to recent discoveries of copper mines so it's been you know it like everything every research area it's dynamic and like there's new things happening all the time so um like the green of the copper mineralization like say that's one clue that we'll be looking for and then there's certain vegetation associated with um, <clears throat> copper. Um, because actually lots of things don't like copper. That's why it's like um, used in, um, like say, weed killing. Um, and then from the processing, there's spoil heaps, there are the actual mines themselves, um, the tools, and then the byproducts. And then the Holy Grail, um, Bronze Age serve furnaces. If anyone finds one of them, um, you know, it might be uh, quite groundbreaking. So the, the copper mineralization is actually, I mean, it's really striking. So I say before anybody even knew what, what that this could be transformed into um, copper, like the mineralization in itself, it's like really striking. And um, it must surely have been um, used in some form of adornment or um, you know, pigment. Um, so there are different ways in which you can see it. So this is like, say, seen from a boat at sea. So that's actually maybe 100 meters away looking up a cliff. So if you were in the Bronze Age and you were looking for copper, um, and you already, of course, were aware of the, like, the smelting potential of it, then there have been different ways in which you would have looked for it. And by sea would have been like one way. Um, and then um, sometimes the, the copper is just visible on a rock exposure um, and it's often found in association with quartz. And if anyone goes to Valencia Island, go to um, Bolhomerum Bay. And if you stand at a parking spot where you can see the skeletes on the horizon, if you look into this cliff area, um, just to the right of the live logo, you'll see some copper mineralization. So lots of copper was extracted from there and um, was must have been used in the, um, the transatlantic telegraph cable. So um, it's still, of course, a, a hugely important um, component in industry. So another way you can tell of this copper is the ore might be just visible. Um, this was shown to be by Paul Rondelay. And this was at, um, he at the historic Metallurgy Society meeting in Killarney at the start of May. It was like just fantastic. But um, we went to mines at Ross Island and um, at Muckross. So he, he, this was new to me, that this also would be a clue that the copper is present. And then nicely, um, what you also get by copper, what the unexpected vegetation can be plants that would normally grow the sea and um, plants that have a high tolerance to salt can be found inland um, near where you might find copper. So if you were in the Bronze Age, that might have been something, again, that you might have noticed that, that would put you on the alert. There might be copper around. And then one of my favorite ones is um, there's a, a metal-loving 
um, lichen, a metallophyte lichen called stereocolin. And it's um, quite crunchy on the foot, as I discovered when I walked in some recently. It's a protected lichen or lichen, and, uh, and it grows. It can be found in association with copper. So if, if you see that, then you're on high alert um, because it'll, it grows in association you know, with metals. So here in this image, you can just see that there is some um, green mineralization just really close to where the lichen is. Um, yeah, so I suppose personally, I, I really like indirect ways of finding things you know, where um, there are other hints in the natural world, maybe that point to something for you. Um, then a more prosaic, um, but <clears throat> kind of quite dramatic way of maybe finding a copper mine would be a spoil heap. So this is um, a code. So that spoil is actually from um, 18th century, 19th century workings. So they, but beside that, there's also a Bronze Age mine. So um, these mines were could well have been um, Bronze Age mines reworked. So they, the print of the earlier mine then would be lost. So you have the, the just the remaining workings from the, the recent ones. And you have, um, the boreholes in or shot holes in these um, workings where they actually put a stick of dynamite in and it like, exploded everything. And a poor lad at the turn of the last century was playing up there and found some dynamite and uh, injured his hand um, and had a story for life out of it. Um, so there's some more spoil. So this was like actually the first spoil like that I really noticed. And I was walking along Lambeth Head and when I saw this, I thought like, who's building a house up here, oh, for God's sake? And I was really angry when I saw it. And then when I investigated further, um, and I realized that it was a spoil heap. And the reason that I thought it might have been somebody doing some kind of construction is because plants don't grow much around um, you know, metal rich rocks. So they have a kind of forever young look about them, you know, keep that kind of really fresh appearance. So if you see something like that yourselves, like that would be something to be on the alert for, something that's, if you like, suspiciously fresh looking. And then just up the hill from that then, um, there was this copper working. So there were no um, rounded cobbles, stone moles, hammer stones, um, seen or found by me or anyone um, close to that mine. So uh, I wasn't, hadn't actually been on the record until um, you know, the spoil heap alerted me to it. Um, so the rock there is also very friable. So it'd be possible that um, the, the rock could have been extracted by um, like, you know, some, just a direct tool or um, anchor without the use of fire setting which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, now, an interesting thing about, say, the distribution of copper, because where we are, Anivra is the large peninsula, and just there um, where the Arrow is, and that's where Alihis is. So that's not on the, the Bronze Age copper mines because um, nothing was discovered there. But I'd say the print was probably wiped out by later work because... Um, uh, Theo Dolka, he found a copper mine there with evidence of fire setting just in 2009. So um, that's like a nice significant find there. Um, so then when you find, you know, you've had all the traces and the clues, then you're rewarded with this. So you actually see like copper caves. So they're really dramatic to see. And, uh, and they're like a really amazing, like tangible piece of our industrial heritage. So they, they're not deep, the ones that we have. Um, they're really kind of just maybe a few metres deep. And this is where the copper is extracted. So they're nearly always at the base of like quite a, um, a high cliff and like an, an inland are the ones that like we've seen so far. Um, so there, again, that dark that's the opening that's into a copper mine. So if you see something like that, again, um, you know, let us know... <laughs> Let someone know anyway, because copper mines are really rare. Um, we have like 75 all over the country from all eras, but um, from the prehistoric area, then the numbers are far less, like there's only about 45. 
So this one was a really nice discovery. Um, so there's a guy called Alistair Lings, he's an, an environmental scientist, and he, he's to a holiday on Lamb's Head. And he, you know, with his expertise as a former prospector, he, um, he realized that the shape of this rock um, suggested that there might be a hollow underneath. So um, in an action that is remembered very well by anyone who was fishing that day, um, he came along at another point um, with a pump and he pumped handheld pump and he pumped out water for six hours and then he revealed like a bronze age copper workings like underneath it um so it's actually quite a big site and um the copper workings have a kind of a smooth concave wall and this is um characteristic of uh fire setting so a fire would be set at the base of a rock and then the um the actual rock surface then would kind of spall away um, and, and in a very in a smooth way so that even when tools are, are used like you don't see tool marks. Um, so then to add insult to, to injury well, except the opposite because it's a really good thing he um, Alistair found a processing site so like it's it's really to, to visit this now it's, it's as if everyone down tools one day and just walked off so you can still see the, the tools with the impact marks in them. And um, so if, when I bring people there, like I'm always like really vigilant and pleading people just to leave them where they are. Because like in the, like the antiquarians were to always taking the copper hammer stones from Ross Island and take them all home. And it's like all, anything that when it's here in your own house or my house or anyone's house, it's lost its its story, its provenance, its context, it means nothing. And it's it's really, to me, like this process inside, it means more than even the copper mines because you can see this is where people got the ore from the mines and they actually use the stones in their hands. And um, there's a big rock close by, which they would have used as an anvil. And then they, they separated the, um, the copper rich rock from the ore. And then that would have been... Um, cleaned and washed and further sorted until then that eventually would be smelted. And um, we have sites still like around the country where the hammer stones are just left the way they were. Uh, like it's a spectacular. Um, and then the kind of holy grail then is to find, say, Bronze Age um, smelting site and metalworking sites. So there have been um, some indications and um, some slag found. And most recent um, has been by um, Dr. Paul Rondley of the Historic Met Metallurgy Society. So when we went to Muckross, we went to Lakeside. And so this is where we found slag. So it's very near Muckross House. Um, it just means scaling some kind of really high bits of cliff to get back onto the road. So he, um, he, we can't tell just by looking at it, like it's flat baked slag. So I'll show you now what it looks like. And you can see, see those lines, like not in the hand, but on, on the rock, on the slag. So they're like the flow lines, you know, from when it was liquid. So that's called um, Plattenschlachen in German. And uh, it's a, a form of um, plate slag. So, like, if you're on a beach now somewhere at Mokros, <laughs> if you're walking by the lake shore, is anyone who's from Killarney here? Um, like, this is something that you can keep an eye out for. Um, so it's it's something that's of like huge significance archaeologically, and uh, something you could find yourself, you know, amidst all the pebbles on the beach. Um, so everything um, like that builds into the story because. Copper slag, whether from whatever era, even if it's um, late medieval, it's still is really rare. So it's really important to find. Um, now, in terms of the um, other archaeology that's near copper mines, like there's <clears throat> contemporary, say, with the Bronze Age, um, are close to. So, say something like a ring fort. It's like, say, a thousand years ago, uh, the copper mines from Bronze Age are 2,400 years um, BC. So that's 4,400 you know, years ago. So we're looking for something really old. So really, 
one of our oldest um, archaeology is um, something which I'm a specialist is rock art. And this was recently discovered near Code Copper Mine. Now, it can't be said like it's directly associated with it, but it's, um, it's uh, physically or geographically close. Um, and at stake, um, or a list that's um, well known for stake fort, there is um, like some really beautiful rock art. This is an example of it um, in the area. And it's from a style of um, carving called cup and ring um, rock art. But also up there, there are these little really fine rings, which are not, um, have hardly been documented. There's something I'm really interested in. So they're also found um, like uh, on the same panel as rock art. And, uh, and there you can see them from that view. And <clears throat> the day that um, I discovered the cup mine in Lamb's Head from the slag, I was actually hunting for some rings that had been found by Vinnie Highland, um, local man here. And, um, and they're the same kind of rings, like they're so fine. So like that's, I just have them highlighted in because you know, you wouldn't see them, but they're not at all natural. Um, and then this is up at Stake Fort. So the fort is indicated by the lower arrow and the mine at Stake Fort by the higher arrow. <clears throat> so there could be chance, like you have a um, thousand rock art panels around the country. So if you do get some rock art near a copper mine, that's not to say they have to be in any way associated. And likewise, if um, you know the, the rings, those fine rings can be found in areas, they're extremely rare now, but still, um, you know, it's not a, it's still something that's under research. And here's a, a fine big rock that's on the way up to um, Co Copper Mine. And that's just got like one little hollow on it. So it wasn't until Joyce found the second panel that I went back to visit this and thought, well, you know, that could be maybe associated. Um, so there, there's some there's some new uh, and really nice kind of little bit of um, research being done. Um, and so that this this now relates to say the vegetation that could be associated with copper mines. So um, what we looked at before with the lichen and the plants were ones which say grow where there's copper. But now this is a whole new and different idea. And it's that um, the possibility that metal prospectors from elsewhere came to Ireland and brought their own vegetation with them, which then took hold and grew in the areas where they were around copper mines. So um, I was actually in Portugal before Christmas and I was eating the fruit of the strawberry tree all the way along in like a Neolithic highway um, and didn't know then the, the paper then came out at the end of the year. And it's um, by Micheline Shees Geffington from NUIG. And the finding uh, is it's based on earlier research and I've, I've given all the references in the last few slides um, where the Arbutus unido, which we have in Ireland, was always thought to be native. And there'd be plenty of reasons to think so. Um, so there was some pollen found um, by Mitchell dating to about 4,000 years ago, a pollen grain. There was um, charred Arbutus unido found at the Ross Island mines, and that was carbon dated. And that was from, again, um, over 4,000 years ago. Um, it's, it was one of the noble trees in Ireland, so it's like along with the holly and oak and our other noble trees, like the Arbutus is there. Sometimes substituted by honeysuckle because its distribution isn't um, completely nationwide, countrywide, islandwide. Um, and then it's also mentioned by, in like say, um, the story of Dermot and Grania, that the two that the Dangan brought um, uh, crimson nuts and uh, beautiful berries and sweet berries. So, and a characteristic actually of the fruit of the strawberry tree is that they, they're meant to ferment like on possibly when they're very ripe to ferment on the tree itself. Now I had really loads of them. I didn't notice anything, but uh, there's natural real drink made from them, which is where you put um, the fruit into 
some kind of a vessel, a vessel that would have been available in the Bronze Age for sure. And, uh, and he just um, put some water in with the fruit and it ferments without any yeast or any other additions. And then in a few months time, you have a kind of a grappa. So, um, so one of the arguments is that perhaps metal prospectors coming to Ireland from um, somewhere else then brought this with them. So they had a ready supply of um, you know, alcohol down the line. So the genetic tests were done and there were samples taken from Ireland and elsewhere in Europe and uh, including Brittany and Iberia. Um, so the Arbutus unido in Ireland is genetically identical to that in Iberia. And they now think that it must have been introduced because um, its haplotype would have taken on a whole different character if it had always been native here. So to say brought in. So that's the distribution of copper mines and the Arbutus. So the Sligo is the anomaly. So we need a copper mine up in Sligo if we're going to make the case, like a really convincing case for, um, for that connection. Um, there's some really strange sound. Then, um, yeah, and then I just have a map here showing the, the rock art. And again, there's so much more rock art. Um, you couldn't make a direct um, connection like a, a fellow, Paul McWhite, 1946, came up with, um, a, a, yeah, he developed a theory that metal prospectors from Spain had come to Ireland to get um, copper and gold. And actually on the map, um, I don't know if you can see the full map, but the, in Wicklow, which is quite rich in gold, um, and then in the southwest, there is actually quite a lot of rock art. And so the rock art and the um, Arbutus are, are also, say, found in the same areas. So there might be an overall connection where that everything you know, is, has a bearing on something else. And then there's nice Welsh connection. So um, like there are prehistoric copper mines in Wales. And um, so some of the tools have been found on Irish sites. So I didn't talk about the tools Really, we haven't found that many. So what we need is um, to uh, do an excavation of a copper mine in the bog or somewhere where um, wood you know, might have a kind of a good survival rate. And then we'd see all the things like the shovels and the other buckets they would have used. So um, we have some artifacts and some are on display in the Cork Public Museum um, in Fitzgerald Park. But we just don't have much. But some that have been found have been similar tools found in Wales. There's a paper by Simon Timberlake, I have the reference there. But also for the um, Arbutus Unido is found near a Bronze Age copper mine in um, Wales as well. So that might also suggest um, that this is a really rare plant, okay? The Arbutus Unido is the strawberry tree. Um, so like well, it might be locally successful. So there's lots um, you know, on um, around Loch Lian, like otherwise it's very rare. So we, um, yeah, it's it's all kind of like a work in progress. So they, there is um, like evidence pointing to a connection between um, Iberia and Ireland for um, copper mines. Um, and then there's, there's also been like in the past, you know, con considerations of a connection between Ireland and Brittany for um, say things like rock art and passage to art, definitely passage to art. And so that's been kind of slammed in recent years by um, the genetic studies done in Newgrange, which found that possibly the like patch tomb builders came from Iberia, but then like really new work um, by um, a man I studied with, um, he, um, that there have been, this is new to me now and I really like it, is that it's Bronze Age copper axe shaped ingots. So they, they were actually found in Brittany at the turn of the last century. So like we know that the Vikings used to use what they call hack silver as a kind of a trading commodity. So they'd actually, like say they had a piece of silver that literally hack it apart and then trade that as money. So um, but this is a kind of nearly like a form of hack copper. So that's, that's pure copper and it's, it's cast in an ax shape, but not as a functional tool. And then, uh, so the thinking is, is that they were um, exported 
are sent out to Brittany, and then from there they could be made into bronze. So even though they might be made when bronze was being made, um, that's not to say they, the, 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 the manufacture into bronze had been done in France. So, um, you know, for in Ireland, we have like loads of copper, but we don't have tin. We don't have very little tin. So you need tin to make tin bronze. And uh, so there's lots of tin in Cornwall. So later, after our child prolific very start of the Bronze Age, we did then start it um, to trade then with Cornwall and get our tin and copper then and you know manufacture from there. But this is a whole other kind of a, a commodity trading, if you like, to in the kind of contemporary term. So this is where we're actually like trading copper directly to Brittany. And every type of metal has um, its own particular chemical composition. So like say copper might have um, elements of like lead and gold and arsenic and, and lots of other elements in it. And so you can actually get a reading from each piece of copper from each area. And it's like, say like a kind of effectively a barcode. And so that can be, um, so if you get an artifact and no matter where in the world it's from, if you have the, the composition of the copper, say from Ross Island or from elsewhere, you can tell where, that, where the material for that artifact came from. So that's like a lovely bit of science that feeds into what we know about um, where the copper from Ireland you know, went, how far it traveled. Um, so these are just some of the references. Um, I don't know if you want to take a screenshot or if, if you're interested or you can um, you know, watch the video back. Um, and this is like the two of these papers then are about the Unido um, Arbutus Unido. Um, and, and I've like then there have been like lots of over the years, like amazing people um, have given me like great information. So, um, like, especially Paul Ronjane and Alistair Lings and Richard Unit have been really helpful, um, giving like geological and scientific and uh, metallurgic background to, to um, some of that research. And uh, yeah, so if anybody um, would have a question, we're delighted. <laughs> Thanks, Evan. Um, do you want to stop sharing so we can see people again? Um, oh, okay. That was a lovely presentation, gorgeous photos, and um, tons of great information, as always. Um, but there is one question already in the chat from Andrew asking if there's a possibility of the cup and rings being molds for metal castings, which is something I hadn't ever thought about. But have you? Heard anything about those links between rock art and? Um, yeah, it, it's it's not known, um, so it doesn't appear to have happened. Um, they um, like when you're casting metal, you need a special. Um, I mean, you need you use either clay or stone mold, but they have to be um, tolerant of the heat. Um, so not some things like with the heat would shatter, but they, like the rock art itself is often on um, quite undulating and sloping surfaces. So it's, it's not on a kind of, if you like a flat canvas um, with a rim around the edge, you know, to, to form um, like it's a natural kind of a, a mold for it. Um, and I also, I mean, it would, I've considered, but I don't think that happened either, that if you had, say, sheet metal that you might have hammered the, um, the, the metal onto rock art and then taken the form from that there, you know, so not actually casting, but a different technique. Um, the no artifacts have been found that seem to reflect that. So a lot girl, like in Limerick, there's been... Um, uh, you know, really nice shields found which have a boss in the front. So that's like, it's like the negative, you know, of rock art um, with lots and lots of rings and really elaborate work. But that was clearly um, 
all of that was like crafted and, and not not um, it wasn't wasn't cast like from rock art. Maybe a pattern that people that was really significant for for more reasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like even things like Tara, like you get a kind of a hollow with an enclosure in all sorts of different contexts. So, like, um, mm -hmm. it might have been like something that fed into their ideology. Yeah, interesting. Um, there's another question here then from Liam about how far Bronze Age copper travelled from Ireland. So where else in the world has it turned up? Um, it's definitely turned up in Scandinavia. Um, like, I don't know exactly how far, is, that's, that's like a nice question, I like, think oh, a nice question. But like one of the things is that there is, um, how far we can tell anything has travelled, like the metal it depends on, there's a bank, like a data bank where all the um, compositions of the metal are stored. So one, the analysis has to be done of the metal of a region. And you can actually use slag, like you don't, you don't need to use, um, you don't need an actual artifact. You know, it's just enough that it's from the area. And then once that's banked, and then if another artifact can be checked against that. So I think that data bank has really been built up. It's a kind of a work in progress. So as time goes on, we'll know more about you know, how the metals traveled and how much. But it, the Ross Island was like um, the earliest, biggest um, copper mine in Western, Western. Europe, Europe, Northwestern Europe. So a lot of the mine, the copper from there was being exported throughout Europe, like in its day. Wow, that's interesting. And presumably across or using the Atlantic as well. Um, mm -hmm. Travel around, yeah. Um, does anybody else in the audience have a question? I saw some hands up, but they seem to have gone down again. So maybe <laughs> people had people's virtual arms were getting tired. Um, does anyone want to jump in any other comments? Nothing else there. Um, uh, okay. Yeah. Well, carry on. What were you saying? I was just going to say, um, like, there's a technique with a lead isotope dating where they can give the provenance of gold and approximate approximation of its age um but that that doesn't work for copper um it, it's it, there's too much helium or anyway it's like it it works for gold doesn't work for copper so if you it works to a certain degree so we can't um we can't use that technique for for patient the region of copper so if people want to come and see the copper mines or engage with this piece of our Bronze Age heritage, how should they go about that? Are, are these mines accessible? Are they worth going to see? Or are they, you know, can you kind of interpret them just as a, as a normal mortal without having any specialist knowledge? Or how's the best way to, to really look at these things? Um, yeah, well, certainly, I think, like, say, a lot of copper mines like those on the Barham and Mount Gabriel and the ones in Ross Island are, are waterlogged. So if you go to where they are, like you can't actually go, you can't really approach them. There's, um, they're fenced off and there's gates with padlocks. So you're, you're kind of just in the general area. Whereas on, on Ivora, you, you, can, um, you can go on your hands and knees and cr crawl right in. So if you're armed with a little bit of knowledge you know then you can say approach the copper mine you can look out for like the vegetation along the way so like one of the things also is um you often get chamomile around um the copper mines um, and that might also be something to do with an introduction like it just maybe if the copper miners are making chamomile tea this is quite rare, rare in Ireland, but it's more common, say, in the southwest. And you really actually see it literally on the way up to the copper mines. Um, and so, like, you'll also, you might make an observation, you know, that, like, it will add, you know, something that we haven't seen. Like, say, just the camel thing is something that's only a possibility. Um, mm -hmm. Then, um, you know, you can keep an eye out for the, for the lichen. And, um, and then once you're... Um, past the, the, if you go through the spoil, you know, just finger it, you know, just, I mean, just look at it, you'll, um, you'll find fragments of hammer stones and you'll see lots of mineralization in 
the rock, and you'll see exactly how things were sorted. So little, little bits of copper will still be left. Um, a lot of that will be quartz. Um, and then there was like the copper mine that I discovered in Lamb's Head had no quartz um, in the spoil. And uh, so then a local man, Michal Sheehan, told me that the person who owns the land years and years ago, um, local knowledge, like they had known that there was a spoil heap there, had taken the quartz to make a garden wall. So sometimes um, it's also worth just talking to anyone in the area about what they know, because they might have something that might fill in a gap or explain, you know, something that's an anomaly. Um, mm. And then when um, you get to the mine, like you can see the smearing inside it often. It's just a little bit, you know, so you can tell. Yeah. Um, Mikhail, Mikhail, not sure how to pronounce your name, but has put some um, links in the chat and a reference to beaker culture pot pottery. I'm not sure if you want to add to that an explanation. Would you want to maybe come off mute and, and give us a quick summary of yeah, like, like they, that's a huge area. So like I just, I just didn't go into that, <laughs> but um, a fascinating and a rich area of study. Um, so they, the, the early copper, um, the early Bronze Age was called Chalcolithic. Like they, the the people who are associated with the copper are, we are used to always be called like the beaker people, and. Uh, and they're called after guess what? Like they're beakers, you know, they're pottery, and uh, so very, very finely worked um, with like lovely designs, lots of like zigzags, um, and um, they had cord, the twisted cord, and pressed into the pottery. So very, very finely worked and very beautiful pottery, and a, a lot of um, shards of beaker pottery were found in Ross Island. The excavation. So when Ross Island was investigated, like it's actually a really big area, and then like there were like amazing results, but only 0.8% of the whole area was actually excavated. Um, but of course, you know, it was targeted. So a little tiny little crumbs of beaker pottery you know, were found. Um, and then and, and different smaller pieces. So like uh, there were the sound ridge was all made. So I think there are about like 500 what we'd be called shards of pottery. Um, and since then, um, beaker pottery has been found occasionally like in road excavation works. And there's also mm -hmm. some beaker pottery was found um, at say at Newgrange. So I think when the beaker pottery is found in association passage tools, that it's thought because the passage tools been dated to like 3,000, 3 or 4, 500 BC and um, that that those sites must still be known and were visited after their construction, you know, by people. So they used to be said that, that yeah. the Beaker people had long skulls, you know, sort of like in profile, you know, the head would go up. So when I wear a hat, I try and like look like a Beaker person sometimes. Um, I never heard of it. You always hear of the lack of pottery in, in Ireland. Um, if there are no other questions from uh, the audience, um, the link as well to some of the digital walking routes um, locally that we've put together, even and, and others of our colleagues have put together, is there in the chat as well, if any of you are in this part of the world and would like to explore. I know even you're adding archaeological tidbits to those, um, and we'll probably have some kind of archaeology specific walks as well, or itineraries. Yeah. There. We, um, we, we'll have, um, we expect to have a walk up to the, um, the, the St. Cajon's Hermitage, that's the one that's the image on the, um, with the green quartz cave with the really green mineralization. It's on the first slide and on the last slide. And, um, and, and that would have been worked like all around the outside and at the back in later times. And I would say that it was the, um, this, the tradition of the saint having used the place as a hermitage that protected it you know, from being totally yeah. demolished. Yeah. So that, that's actually very suitable for a walk. So if anyone's coming down, let us know. We can arrange something too. Okay. All righty. Um, we try and make sure that we don't fill or overfill the, the lunchtime hour um, in case people need to go and grab refreshments and get back to work. So 
thank you so much, even for a really interesting talk. And uh, to everyone in the audience who's joined us, lots of comments coming through there now in the chat. Um, and hopefully you'll stay in touch with the project, sign up to our newsletter um, if you haven't already, and we'll hopefully see you again sometime soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.